a dog may lessen just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta? Or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Teflology. Hello, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to Teflology, a podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Teflologists. Tefl News. For this week's news section, um, I'd like to talk about some uh, preliminary findings from a national corpus that's been conducted. Uh, well, it's being conducted this year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the name of the corpus is the British National Corpus, mm-hmm. 2014. Yeah. Um, the corpus itself is is not very new. Um, mm-hmm. They've done previous um, editions, I guess, mm-hmm. in 1991. 1994 and in 2007 right uh, but this is the first one for seven years okay that they've done um, obviously there are lots of famous corpuses mm-hmm. that have been uh, for example the Vienna Oxford International Corpus of English or voice mm-hmm. yeah are you aware of that one I think we spoke about it on a previous episode mm. it came up yeah yeah yep. and there's also an English multi-speaker corpus uh, conducted at the University of Edinburgh Oh, which I can't pronounce, it's like C S T R V C T K. It's it's very easy. It's Kastrovitik. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, an easy way to remember. And there's yeah, also well, Ka- Kastrovitik. Nice. <laughs> that's probably not. Yeah. There's also a Coca. That's easy. Mm-hmm. Um, a corpus of contemporary American English at Brigham Young University in in, um, in the states. So that's the um, that's the Mormon University, isn't it? Yes, in Utah. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So <clears throat> the, the the corpus in itself is is not news. Basically, that's what I'm trying to convey. Right. But I'll talk about why it's made the headlines a bit later on. Uh, just to give you some background, the the British National Corpus or BNC for short is um, a corpora, a collection mm. of language. We were talking about this earlier. We weren't sure. Yeah. A corpora. It's a corpus. A corpus. It's a corpus. It is a One corpus. One of corpora. Yeah, and according to some dictionaries, the stuff within it. The sentences within is, it are also are a corpora. Okay, yes. well, well, th- well, that is <laughs> that is a hundred million word collection of samples of written and spoken word. language yeah. from a wide range of sources. Mm. Um, with this particular corpus, it's from information in the latter part of the twentieth century, both spoken and written. So right. it doesn't look at older varieties of English or archaic. Mm. Yeah, when varieties. was it? When was it initially mm. created? The first one was nineteen ninety one. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought it was a, a older than that. Uh, it may well be, but the first collection was compiled oh, okay. in nineteen ninety one. So it might have been going on previous or prior to that, right. perhaps. Um, and it was completed in nineteen ninety four. Mm. So, um, with this corpus, it's monolingual. It only deals with British English, no other languages. Yeah. Um, and and also no other dialects of English. No other di. Well, I, I think they. Try to cover a number of different dialects of English, of but, British, but British, British, English, British, English, British yeah. English. Yeah, okay. yeah. Hmm. yeah. But they do mention that foreign languages do occur. Obviously, in the corpus, people use yeah. or code switch or use different things. Yeah. Mm. Um, Actually, I mean that's an interesting point. I wonder when they say British English, do they mean British English or do they mean English used in Great Britain? Yeah. 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 I I think they. Well, I, I think it's probably changed over the years because I I seem to remember that the initial project was from the. 60s or 70s I, I guess mm. um, and so back then maybe what was considered British English and now what's considered British English has, has probably shifted a little bit yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean but also now if you just go out and collect English from you know mm. the from I don't know radio or TV yeah. produced in Great Britain you're very likely to get some American English Australian English yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's a good yeah. point well um, they, they say that this corpus in particular is um, <clears throat> it's not limited to a field or genre or register, mm. so it mm-hmm. kind of covers a lot. Yeah. But the, the new one that's being conducted this year, um, created by Lancaster University yeah. and Cambridge University Press, mm. 
focuses on real life informal interactions. Mm. Right. And what they're currently or still encouraging people to do is send in MP3s of mm. recordings they they've made themselves. Ah, or cool. they've can, collected themselves. We can send them tephalology. So we no. can send this podcast. <laughs> is, it, is it natural enough? I guess it is. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. You'd have to leave though, because it's yes. <laughs> yeah, right. I think they they f- they filter out the ones that aren't appropriate or not. But right. they give you eighteen pounds if for the every six. It's like you being framed. Yeah. That's a reference to, <laughs> to any of the British viewers where you, you send in a video and you get money. For America's it. funniest home videos. Okay. Uh, right, yeah. right, right. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Keep so it's it's kind of kind of like cultural. <laughs> So yeah, so with the 2014 one, they're actually looking for the public to send in their their examples, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and they're they're saying that some implications or applications of this corporate is that um, it can be assessed through the dem- a demographic criteria, right? Uh, including gender, age, and socio economic status. You mean when when you search it, you can search for examples of yeah. speech from those different areas? Yeah, things right, are coded okay. in. By gender, by age, by socio-economic areas. Okay. Uh, Britain, for example, it's still ongoing, obviously. So they've only got a few results to talk about. And the reason I wanted to talk about this today was it's kind of made the news in the UK over the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, a few newspapers, such as the Guardian, the Daily Mail, loosely a newspaper, <laughs> the the Independent, of uh, they've talked about some of the preliminary findings right. from this corporate. I will now talk about. Uh, firstly, before I do, yeah. what do you think it might have found or might have shown up? Well, as we were discussing earlier, maybe it's maybe it would have found that there's been a shift in English uh, norms, I guess, uh, British mm-hmm. English norms over the last few years, due to you know uh, influx of other populations and so mm-hmm. on. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's, you mean like uh, a more American, for example, American TV shows, influencing mm-hmm. the way people speak, or yeah, mm-hmm. like. You know, changes in intonation, like or, or um, like as in the rising question intonation, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the examples they mention in, in the newspapers are that um, there's a lot of American words, obviously, like you just okay. said, have yeah. uh, come into usage. Um, for example, the word marvelous mm. is has gone out of fashion, mm. completely gone. Mm-hmm. It only crops up twice. I still use that. <laughs> <laughs> only crops up twice per million words. As right. opposed to in the 90s, 155 times hmm. per million words. Wow. And they kind of, they were talking about reasons that might be, uh, I think, uh, Roald Dahl's book, um, George's Marvelous Medicine. Uh, yeah, yeah. People mm-hmm. talked about that a lot more in the 90s. Right. That's one of the exa- <laughs> really. the reasons they gave for that. So was did Fantastic come back with the release of Fantastic Mr. Fox? And the well, Fantastic yeah, Four. An and the Fantastic Four. Uh, awesome. Though that that's that now appears seventy two ah, yes. per million words, yeah. and it didn't before. And mm-hmm. apparently, they equate that to the Americanization yeah. of, yeah. of all things, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder what happened to words like uh, wicked, mm. wicked sharp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things yeah. like that. They also talk about um, endangered words such yep. as Fortnite. Right, uh, is that an endangered word? Uh, wow. Apparently so. Not not okay. in Britain, but. That's where this corpus is. Right, but, right. Yeah, but when obviously when we I speak to American colleagues, um, they say, "What's what's a fortnight?" Yeah, yeah. Like two weeks. Yeah, and and the word Cheerio, mm. <laughs> which is not a breakfast cereal, although I think it's it is not. a breakfast cereal. Oh, it is. It a is a breakfast cereal. But it, it's a, Cheerio is. A, Right. It's, an in, it's an informal way to say. Well, the plural Cheerios well. refers both to each individual Cheerio <laughs> and the collective. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It depends so, which dictionary you're reading, right? So that's that's endangered, apparently. I'm not really Cheerio. too bothered about yeah. that word, to be honest. No, it's a bit of a stupid word. Like, like pandas. Yeah. What, what um, do you use instead of Cheerio? Laders. <laughs> see, see ya? I guess see is that, again that's quite American but that's yeah. um, and also words such as locomotive and walkman are very redundant and huh. not mm. talked what's, about what's replaced them well they're, they're saying that these days words such as Facebook Google the internet obviously yeah. they've kind of come into fashion and usage mm. and yeah yeah basically yeah and I mean there's no question as to why that's happened basically yeah. locomotive would be train I guess Train, right? Yeah, which would just be all the people who used to say locomotive dying off, like with wireless and radio. Yeah, locomotive, a bit. I mean, even when I was a kid, I remember people saying locomotive. Right. When were you a kid? <laughs> when was that? <laughs> it was a while ago. But um, 
Yeah, it's it's not a word that's ever. It's a, I feel it's only been used in old westerns. Or, yeah, and well, steam festivals. Steam festivals. Also, right. also the word catalog, which is still you catalogs are still used. Yeah, that's gone out of fashion now. Maybe people don't use catalogs so much for. I guess to be websites. Yeah, yeah. Websites, yeah. So I guess this corpus has kind of shown that our, I guess our activities have changed the way we do things in the world have changed, and that's reflected in the language that we use. Basically, mm. that's that's one of the findings. Yeah. One of the take homes from it. And do you think this is going to influence teaching materials? Because I, I remember a um, <coughs> conversation yeah. that some of my colleagues were having about teaching um, teaching verbs, uh, you know, suitable verbs for different actions. And it was um, it was uh, surf the web, and that was the example given in all the textbooks. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, no one says surf the web. Yeah. What can you yeah. say instead of surf the web? Go on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> but go we don't. On, yeah. Go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the, use the internet, yeah. yeah. So do you think these results are going to... Yeah, but play a, a role well, in shaping I, language teaching I material. I think they should. I mean, mm. I think they should. I think any, any, for example, any person who's thinking about writing a textbook or making their own materials, if possible, should refer to a corpus to yeah. see what words are going to be most commonly used. Perhaps I suppose, almost yeah. Phrases. I mean, if it's a corpus like that, which is constantly being um, added to and, and yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, things change very quickly. We're lucky we, look, right. we work in an environment where our textbook is revised every mm. every year, but we still sometimes fall behind what the students are used to. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Even talking about email, I remember one one of our colleagues mentioning that there's her students they don't they don't think about it in terms of email or the internet. They just mm. think about apps, and that's how they communicate. Yeah, yeah. online. There's kind of like you know uh, text messages. Um, people don't say text messages very yeah, much. No, no. They say they say messages, messages. or or. Yeah. or uh, line is mm-hmm. it, that's a Japanese thing for the listeners yeah. who uh, aren't familiar with it, but yeah. it's another kind of messaging system. Mm. Um, and I guess other countries have their own versions of it. So people don't say text messages or yeah. Yeah. whatever. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it must be difficult to keep up. I guess. I mean, this is essentially this is for native speakers. Mm. So I guess if if a if someone was going to try and teach multi, what's the word, lingua franca, mm. they'd maybe have to look for a, a lingua franca corpus. Yeah, like the, the voice corpus. Like the voice corpus, for example, for a better way to kind of use mm. language that everyone's going to understand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so as I say, these are just preliminary findings. The corpus is still being conducted, so if you do want to send anything to it, or send this to it if you like, I mean, obviously we, we, we'd get the money. Yeah, <laughs> you, send it. you can have a commission of um, 1% of the, pro- the profits. Sure. Right. And if, if you do record yourself speaking and send it in, use the word teflology a lot. So yeah. It, uh, <laughs> so it ranks highly. It's in the dictionary. Yeah. Okay, so that's today's Tefl News. Cheerio. Tefl cultures. Uh, okay, for today's uh, Tefl culture, I'd like to talk about a language teaching method, mm-hmm. um, one that I think we're all kind of familiar with, but maybe uh, not, maybe the, the least respected method, or one of the least right. respected methods, so uh, the audiolingual method. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you're both aware of the term and probably have heard it, about yeah. what it is. I've yeah, heard it's yeah. very unpopular and unfashionable. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, you, what, that's, what I know. that's what I know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you know anything about how it works as a method? Mm. Um, from what I understand, the teacher says, it's, I guess it has some roots with the TPR, or TPR has roots in the audio lingual method, mm-hmm. in that the teacher would say a word or, a, or some sort of target phrase. The yeah. students would reply back. Dr- a lot of drilling would, would be involved. Um, a lot of behavior is quite behaviorist. It's very behaviorist. I, I believe it was started originally um, as a program in the U.S. Army to mm. to prepare them for uh, well for going abroad and doing service abroad. They had okay. to learn foreign languages, and yeah. so um, yeah, it's, it's based a lot on Skinnerian behaviorist psychology, like yeah. the idea of the mind as a blank slate. Um, so there was a lot of drilling and, and that kind of thing. That's my understanding of it. Yeah, yeah, basically. So it's sometimes known as the Army method, mm. as, as right. you said. Um, the, the U.S. Army, but basically World War II, um, when they realized they had to send a lot of uh, troops all over the world, they wanted a way to um, quickly get uh, soldiers being able to at least use the language a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it also drew on, on the work of kind of early, or maybe American linguists from the beginning of, of last century, mm. um, and one of their main concerns was... Uh, documenting the indigenous languages yeah. of, the, of mm-hmm. America, but they had few trained native uh, speakers of those languages, mm. and so the focus became on oral language. Right. 
rather than anything else. Um, and I mean, there, some interesting things um, that came out of it, um, things like a focus. So it was a development of the direct method. Yeah. So maybe unlike previous or at the time. So this is kind of the 50s or yeah. I guess 40, mid 40s and 50s. Um, at the time, the idea of teaching a language using only the target language mm. was still relatively uh, modern. Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing it did. Um, it focuses on chunks of language. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, it's very little or no explicit teaching of grammar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in some ways, I think some of those things still kind of carry on today. Mm. Um, but it there was very little focus on vocabulary. Yeah. Um, and like you say, um, this idea of repeating after the teacher yeah. is yeah. the main focus. Yeah. yeah. Um, this the it's yeah it's commonly known as being based on Skinner's behaviorist mm. theory. Um, I, d I did a little bit more research about behaviorism. Mm. Um, so I think what, p what we usually know about it is this idea of, um, you know, b behavior is just reinforced by repeating things yeah, yeah. and then getting negative or positive feedback, mm. which, which it is. Um, but the behaviorist ideas originally were basically that we could only judge things based on behavior that we see. Right. In other words, we, we have no idea of what processes are going on in the brain. And because we don't know that, let's just focus on observable behavior. Mm. Okay. Um, so it's kind of treating the mind as a, a black box. Stimuli goes in, action comes out, and we don't yeah. know what's happening inside. Right. Yes, right, without, without trying to understand the yeah. processes that are going on inside. Right, right, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So I guess things have kind of moved in a different direction these days. Like, for example, with like task-based learning, mm -hmm. a lot of the emphasis is on processing and how, how well a task how well the learners can process the language and there's an emphasis on that these days which is very different to this I'd say mm, kind of about creating meaning as opposed to the as opposed to the repetition of chunks the repetition of language more about yeah the, the process by which you get to communication or you get to a, uh, yeah. the goal of the activity and also the process of how mm. the language is being used or automatized mm. that's kind of the emphasis these days I guess yeah so I mean you know several people came along um, Chomsky famously and challenged it on mm. theoretical grounds. Other people did research um, and just basically more or less proved that it was an ineffective method. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what, what's interesting to me is how much of it actually still survives. Mm. Um, and maybe it's, it would be unusual to find a school that teaches an audiolingual method, although there, there are some. Yeah, or that admits mm. that that's what they're doing. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or without rename, usually they rename. I think the Callan method mm. is more or less audiolingual. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's interesting, well, you were talking about uh, Chomsky, mm. how, how he came along and challenged it, because he came up with the idea of generative linguistics, obviously. Yeah. Um, and what, I mean, with at least my understanding of Skinner, I might be slightly wrong based on what you were just saying, but um, in terms of behaviorism, mm. uh, the idea was that you, you kind of learn through observation, learn through repetition, learn through that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas we know that language can't be learned just in that way. It mm -hmm. has to, there has to be some kind of generative device there that helps you build on the knowledge that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, there's a strange thing in language teaching where, I, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but where people try and relate first language learning to second language learning, and they yeah. clearly don't follow the same <laughs> lines at <laughs> all. Maybe some yeah. overlap, but yeah. Some overlap, but yeah. That's yeah. kind of the same with TPR. I think some arguments were made... For mm -hmm. first language there as well. We, yeah. I can't remember the name of the guy, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, maybe one of the the uh, uh, probably a typical audiolingual um, lesson would be listen and repeat. Um, mm. So basically drills. Yeah. Um, but I think it did develop into slightly more communicative drills mm. and slightly more meaningful drills. Yeah. Um, and substitution drills and those kind of things. Um, Do you have an example of what what kind of language they drill? Just. A general example. Um, I think it was it was mainly focused on grammar. Okay. Mm. So it would it would be things like you know the woman is going to the shop and everyone's going to the shop and then the teacher, the woman is going to the zoo. The woman's going to the zoo and eventually the prompts would just be zoo shop da 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 you know, right, different okay. places so, which yeah. people it's like structured yeah. removal of the of the target language. <clears throat> yeah. With right. just yeah, prompts yeah. to help them get to the, yeah. the end point. Or different things or the you know the the, the teacher say yesterday and they'd say, okay the woman was going to the shop yesterday, tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're playing a little bit with the language, um, but there's always a correct answer. 
Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, oh, and, simple. Yeah. and it's maybe not related to, maybe there's pictures of a woman going to the shop. Yeah. But other than that, there's, there's no connection to real life. Is there any communicative um, application? Well, what, what, what mm. activities were, if they were used? In a communicative way? Uh, in the audiolingual classroom. Yeah, very, very few. I mm. think, I mean, like some other examples I found would be, um, you know, the teacher would say, you know, uh, tell me to, to pick up the pen. Mm. And so the student would say, okay, pick up the pen. <laughs> you know, things like that. Right, but, okay, it, right. but other than that, it, it wasn't, yeah, it was very uncommunicative. Yeah, yeah, I see. It was, yeah. It's yeah. often described as in direct opposition to communicative language. Okay, teaching. Mm. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having said that, I'm still, yeah, I think even communicative language teachers or teachers who call themselves communicative language teachers still like to drill. Yeah. Or still yeah. like to spend part of the lesson drilling. Yeah. I think, I think why this was so popular, at least briefly, why you know, it, it became the method to use for a little while, was that it's, I think it's, it, feels kind of, it feels kind of right. Mm. There's something about it where you think, okay, yeah, if, if they repeat it enough times, and it, you know, things like it's automatizing language, yeah. not in a communicative way, but it is, it's still automatizing the sounds coming out of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe instinctively a lot of us think somewhere deep inside, yeah, if, we just, if they repeat it enough, then they'll, they'll learn how to use it. Yeah, but I, I mean, it was, it was effective. That's why it became such a big thing. I, according to all the texts produced at the time that, mm. that I've looked into, it was seen as being very effective, um, and that's why they made it such a massive program for the army. Like, yeah. Whether they were correct about that or right, not right. Is, is a different question, um, but it was seen to be effective. It's, and I think it suited the army well. Yeah, um, you could, lots, you could of lots of drilling. Lots of drilling. Very regimented. Teach, you could teach a lot of people all at once. Yeah. Um, if their goal was to memorize these these chunks, they probably memorized them and maybe could use them in, in situations. Yeah. Um, but like I said, there were they did a lot of uh, research into how effective it was. Mm. Into basically improving communicative competence, yeah. and it was I think it was proven to be quite ineffective. Yeah, it's interesting at my uh, my Japanese school just this week they gave me a um, a survey, and one of the questions was, "Do we drill you enough?" Uh, and the, <laughs> and the options given were enough, not enough, too little. <laughs> right. Everyone would say. No, you drill us way too much. <laughs> too much yeah. um, it's just like we have to repeat really long sentences. Um, and we're so focused on trying to just remember all of the bits of the sentence that I, I can't even remember what the sentence means or what it is. So, yeah. so do you think some, some L1 contexts or some teaching contexts have a preference to audiolingual methods? I think all of them, to an extent, mm. still retain it, I would guess. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think there's definitely... Um, I mean, like I said, I think there, there are aspects of it which maybe do, which are useful. I mean, mm. this idea of automaticity has come back. Yeah. And obviously, yeah. it's, we want it to be creative and, and communicative automaticity. Yeah. Yeah. But there is still this belief that if we use something enough times, yeah. it'll, it'll become easier to use. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I generally agree with that. I think, yeah. And the, this, yeah. there's a belief, I think, among students as well that that's what's going to work. I mean, I, as a teacher, I don't like doing drills. Mm. But there's several times when the students have insisted that I drill them yeah. to the yeah, point yeah. where they're clearly not enjoying it anymore. But they think that that's what <laughs> needs to be done, you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that goes against my teaching principles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, it, researching about this, I, it led me to the Callan method. Mm. Um, and apparently, according to their own literature, the Callan School is the largest private uh, language teaching institution in the world, in London, I can't remember. Yeah. But, yeah. And what they point out is that, is that students, like you said, students do like it. Mm. And teachers like it because it's, you don't need to prepare anything, you yeah. just go in with, with the sheets. But students, there is something very comforting, comforting for students to be able to just repeat Motivate and then feel like, they, yeah. feel like they're yeah. learning something. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, we probably won't be touching on audiolingualism uh, too much in future <laughs> episodes, but uh, yeah. that was uh, this week's culture. TEFL Pioneers. Today's TEFL Pioneer is Harold Palmer. Have uh, either of you heard of Harold Palmer? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Um, well, he was. You've heard it probably from me talking about doing yeah, yeah, the preparation yeah. for this. Okay. Um, so he was a, uh, a linguist who lived between 1877 and 1949. Mm -hmm. um, he was a linguist without any formal training. Um, he learned everything that he knew kind of on the job. He didn't go to university. Uh, what was the job? 
uh, being a linguist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, so he applied for an ad in the paper. <laughs> so he started as a linguist knowing nothing about I, th I think he just, he just was a very enthusiastic amateur who moved into being a professional. Okay. Um, and he became very influential because of his particular focus on uh, the practice of language teaching hmm. um, rather than the theory of, uh, of, of the underlying linguistic uh, structures. Yeah. Um, and he, there were a few different stages to his life. He, he did a lot. He was actually forgotten for a long time until he was rediscovered by um, a few different people. So uh, Richard Smith, who's at the University of Warwick, I think, mm -hmm. and um, Mr. Uh, I don't know his first name, but Tiku, oh, Tiku, yeah, you? yeah. Nice um, who who wrote a, a book about him, which mm. I've got at home, but uh, I haven't finished reading it yet. Mm. <laughs> so maybe th I'll talk about the different stages of his work. Um, initially, he was a phonetician, uh, a, a bit like Henry Sweet, who we spoke about in, F uh, in episode two, um, and he said, uh, so you have to imagine this to the tune of uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein. Mm -hmm. My mission, my ambition, is to be the living model of the perfect phonetician. That was what he said. <laughs> my mission, my ambition. Um, and he was focused on uh, phonetics uh, used for the teaching of English as a foreign language. Mm. So this was something he was very interested in. Um, he wrote a book called English Intonation in 1922, in which he invented a system of tone marks for mm -hmm. foreign la uh, language learners to use. Mm -hmm. um, and he also wrote, it, sorry, also in the book there were lots of practice exercises. So it was a textbook for foreign language learners. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing that he wrote in uh, two years later in 1924 was the first ever grammar of spoken English. So not the first ever grammar of English, mm -hmm. but the first grammar of spoken English, mm -hmm. again, for learners to use, yeah. which I think is quite an advance mm -hmm. in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so that was maybe his, his first major contribution. Um, he also wrote lots of uh, classroom texts on grammar use for teaching. Okay. Um, and the next stage... Uh, of his life was actually working in Japan, where we are now. Mm. So he was uh, invited to Japan in 1922 um, because he would become so famous for his work as a phonetician, mm -hmm. as a grammarian, and as someone who was really interested in the practicalities of language teaching. He was invited by the Japanese Ministry of Education to come to Japan and advise them on the teaching of English in Japanese middle schools, which is Japanese secondary schools. Yeah. So maybe this is relevant to uh, the situation that we've experienced mm -hmm. in Japan, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, he, I, I said he was brought in by the Japanese Ministry of Education, um, but his appointment was actually pushed by a few different individuals, most of them non-Japanese, okay. who were looking for ways to innovate foreign language teaching. Um, the Ministry of Education accepted him uh, as a, an advisor and gave him an office and set up uh, the Institute for Research in English Teaching. But they didn't really know what to do with him. Mm -hmm. So they, mm -hmm. they kind of put him in a room <laughs> and left him there for three years to just get on with his research. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, and his, his, uh, his salary was actually paid by one of these people who was pushing for him to be brought into the country. Mm. Uh, so he spent a few years uh, investigating the Japanese context and he came up with a few different suggestions which he made to the ministry. The ministry wasn't very interested initially because they thought that his suggestions were, mm, they were not suitable for the Japanese context. Okay. So he was focusing a lot on spoken language, teaching mm -hmm. spoken language. Yeah. 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 Um, and what's, I mean, how do you think that that would have gone down at the time? If you were trying to promote spoken language which, education, which which year was this? As in the nineteen twenties. Ah, mm. uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I guess uh, I don't know. I mean, there's always this assumption that Japan in the past, or still now, mm. was very grammar translation focused. A lot of writing, mm. a lot of kind of uh, textbook based. Yeah. Kind of copy, repeat, maybe audio lingual, perhaps. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. How do you think? Um, I mean, I think like even now, if looking at um, books that are um, claimed to be focused on oral communication, mm. um, there's still a stronger uh, emphasis on forms and um, vocabulary and those kind of things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think he was he was trying to push the importance of uh, teaching spoken English, mm. um, but. 
it wasn't really taken up by the ministry. Yeah. Um, so he produced a few different courses. He produced the standard English course, which wasn't based on a, a particular central text. It was kind of a, a series of way, a series of suggestions for ways that local teachers could uh, collect their own texts mm -hmm. and okay. make their own materials that were suitable for their own context. Mm. Um, some interesting things that he suggested, which I think are actually quite uh, revolutionary at the mm -hmm. time, um, he said, you need smaller class sizes, mm -hmm. more non-Japanese teachers, mm. and you need material. And you need to, so you need to change the university entrance exams. Um, so this is something that's still a problem now. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Japanese Ministry of Education is trying to uh, Im improve the communicative language teaching in their schools, and they have all these guidelines and recommendations and things that teachers have to do, mm -hmm. but the teachers can't really implement them because they've still got the university entrance exams, which are all about grammar translation. Yeah. 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 I think the middle point though, what was that? More foreign? Uh, more foreign teachers, yeah. I think. What does he mean by foreign? Native uh, English? Native English. All right, teachers, yeah. so he's had a bias against non native. Well, I yeah, think this was in the. Now, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was something that was, uh, I mean, this was 1924, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Um, that is something that uh, Enric would say about that. Well, <laughs> let's ask him. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I presumably that. That comes, I mean, as you were talking earlier, I was thinking, um, you know, giving guidelines to, you know, the teachers, mm. the secondary school teachers, yeah. the middle school teachers. Um, I imagine them thinking, they're thinking, I don't know any English at all. How am I supposed to? Mm. Um, so I, I can, and it's interesting that maybe, maybe that, that was the start of, um, you know, now we have this ALT system in Japan. Yeah. Where every, every school has a native English speaker go mm. there at least sometimes sometimes they're there every day yeah um and i think there are a lot of problems with that system as well yes but, yeah. like, <laughs> but uh i wonder if that was the kind of start of that yeah i think that it probably was it mm. um interesting i think a lot of his work um was interrupted by the war it was sure. disrupted by the war uh, he left before the war he was replaced by another guy who we may get to later called uh, hornby mm -hmm. um but uh when the war came they changed yeah they changed um <laughs> a lot of uh, the focus of language education in Japan from being focused on British English materials, which they were at the time. Uh, right. So Harold Palmer yeah. was British, I should have mentioned that. Um, yeah. And they, they changed the focus to being entirely, they, they still taught English during that period, mm. but the focus was entirely on Japan. Oh yeah. really, that's interesting, Yeah. even at the time. Yeah, it became a very nationalistic exercise, teaching English yeah. mm. as uh, a way of reinforcing nationalistic mm. ideas about their own country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but perhaps what was interesting about Palmer's work particularly was that, as I said, the Ministry of Education wasn't enthusiastic about his ideas, mm -hmm. but local teachers and local schools did take up his ideas uh, independently mm. of the Ministry's guidelines, and they mm -hmm. started setting up their own curriculums and their own courses based on his ideas, um, mm. adapting materials from their own local contexts yeah. in ways that they could use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did Palmer give seminars or lectures about how or ways to teach? Or yes. was there a lot of writing about? There was a lot of writing. In I mean, Japan. He, he was incredibly prolific in terms of his writing, yeah. Um, but yeah, he did, he did give a lot of ideas. Um, for example, uh, he was uh, famous for giving some lectures which promoted thinking in English, the value of thinking in English, not just uh, teaching language as uh, code, but teaching as speech. Um, and also the value of phonetics and the importance of focusing on oral work. Oh, okay. um, which, considering the context that he was working within, these were quite revolutionary ideas, I think. Yeah. Um, eventually, he did uh, try to change the goals that he was working towards towards a more literacy-based approach, because he realised that was what was expected in yeah. the Japanese context. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. I think, overall, Palmer had a lot of contributions towards ELT. Uh, in Japan, um, he investigated the goals of ELT. Uh, he came up with suggestions and courses and things which I think are still influencing how things are done today. Um, he increased the amount of oral language study, for example, uh, and spread ideas of reform among educationalists and mm -hmm. among teachers. Um, and some of those ideas uh, are still being thought about, they're still being discussed. Um, beyond that, he made uh, a big contribution towards textbooks for learners um, mm. and so on. So, yeah, I think he was... Perhaps an unsung Tefl pioneer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And that's this episode's Tefl pioneer, mm -hmm. Harold Palmer. Mm -hmm.
Thank you for listening to today's episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to get in contact with us uh, to give us any comments or any suggestions, uh, you can send an email to tefalology at gmail.com. So, uh, thank you again for listening. Uh, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.